This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Krista Gurra. Fables for the Frivolous, with Apologies to La Fontaine, by Guy Wetmore Carroll. The Arrogant Fox and the Unapproachable Grapes. A farmer built around his crop a wall and crowned his labors by placing glass upon the top to lacerate his neighbors, provided they at any time should feel disposed to the wall to climb. He also drove some iron pegs securely in the coping to tear the bare defenseless legs of brats who, upward groping, might steal, despite the risk of fall, the grapes that grew upon the wall. One day a fox on seething bent a crafty and an old one, most shrewdly tracked the pungent scent that eloquently told one that grapes were ripe and grapes were good, and likewise in the neighborhood. He threw some stones of diverse shapes, the luscious fruit to jar off. It made him ill to see the grapes so near and yet so far off. His throws were strong, his aim was fine, but never touched me, said the vine. The farmer shouted, Drat the boys, and mounting on a ladder. He sought the cause of all the noise. No farmer could be madder, which was not hard to understand, because the glass had cut his hand. His passion he could not restrain. He shouted out, You're thievish! The fox replied with fine disdain, Come, country, don't be peevish. Now country is an epithet one can't forgive nor yet forget. The farmer rudely answered back with compliments unvarnished, and downward hurled the bric-a-brac with which the wall was garnished, in view of which demeanor strange the fox retreated out of range. I will not try the grapes today, he said. My appetite is fastidious, and anyway, I fear appendicitis. The fox was one of the elite who called it sight instead of seat. The moral is that if your host throws glass around his entry, you know it isn't done by most who claim to be the gentry, while if he hits you in the head, you may be sure he's under breath. End of the Arrogant Fox and the Unapproachable Grapes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Quatran in Quebec City on April 28, 2006. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll The Persevering Tortoise and the Pretentious Hare Once a turtle, finding plenty in seclusion to bewitch, lived a dolce far niente kind of life within a ditch. Rivers had no charm for him, as he told his wife and daughter, Though my friends are in the swim, mud is thicker far than water. One fine day, as was his habit, he was dozing in the sun when a young and flippant rabbit happened by his ditch to run. Come and race me, he exclaimed. Fat inhabitant of puddles, sluggard, you should be ashamed. Such a life the brain befuddles. This, of course, was merely banter, but it stirred the torpid blood of the turtle, and severely forth he issued from the mud. Done! he cried. The race began, but the hare resumed his banter, seeing how his rival ran in a most unlovely canter. Shouting, Terrapin, you're bested! You'd be wiser, dear old chap, if you sat down and rested when you reached the second lap. Quoth the turtle, I refuse. And as for you, with all your talking, sit on any lap you choose. I shall simply go on walking. Now this sporting proposition was upon its face absurd. Yet the hare, with expedition, took the tortoise at his word, ran until the final lap, then, supposing he'd outclassed him, laid him down and took a nap, and the patient turtle passed him. Plodding on, he shortly made the line that marked the victor's goal, paused, and found he'd won, and laid the flattering unction to his soul. Then, in grandiose fashion, like an after-dinner speaker, touched his slipper to his nose, and remarked, Ahem, Eureka! And the moral, lest you miss one, is, there's often time to spare, and that races are, like this one, won not always by a hare. End of The Persevering Tortoise and the Pretentious Hare This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Peter Cat of PeterCatVoice.com, Syracuse, New York, May 2, 2006. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Whitmore Carroll The Patrician Peacocks and the Overweening Jay once a flock of stately peacocks promenaded on a green. There were twenty-two or three cocks, each as proud as seventeen. And a glance, however hasty, showed their plumage to be tasty. Wheresoever one was placed, he was a credit to the scene. Now their owner had a daughter who, when people came to call, used to say you'd really ought her see them peacocks on the mall. Now this wasn't to her credit, and her callers came to dread it, for the way the lady said it wasn't recherche at all. But a jay that overheard it from his perch upon a fir didn't take in how absurd it was to everyone but her. When they answered, You don't tell us, and to see the bird seemed zealous, he became extremely jealous, wishing, too, to make a stir. As the peacocks fed together, he would join them at their lunch, culling here and there a feather, till he'd gathered quite a bunch. Then this bird, of ways perfidious, stuck them on him most fastidious, till he looked uncommon hideous, like a Judy or a Punch. But the peacocks, when they saw him, one and all, began to haul, and to harry and to claw him, till the creature couldn't crawl while their owner's vulgar daughter, when her startled callers sought her, and to see the struggle brought her, only said, They're on the mall. It was really quite revolting when the tumult died away. One would think he had been molting, so disheveled was the jay. He was more than merely slighted. He was more than disunited. He'd been simply dynamited in the fervor of the fray. And the moral of the verses is that short men can't be tall. Nothing sillier or worse is than a jay upon a mall. And the jay opiniative, who, because he's imitative, thinks he's highly decorative, is the biggest jay of all. End of the Patrician Peacocks and the Overweening Jay This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Noam Yogev. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll. The Arrogant Frog and the Superior Bull. Once, on a time and in a place conducive to malaria, there lived a member of the race of Rana Temporaria, or, more concisely still, a frog inhabited a certain bog. A bull of Brobdingnagian size, too proud for condescension, one morning chanced to cast his eyes upon the frog I mention, and, being to the manner born, surveyed him with a lofty scorn. Perceiving this, the Bactrian's frame with anger was inflated, till, growing larger, he became egregiously elated, for inspiration's sudden spell had pointed out a way to swell. Ha ha! he proudly cried, a fig for this, you mammoth torso! Just watch me while I grow as big as you, or, or even more so! To which maniloquential gush, his bullshit simply answered, tush! Alas, the frog's success was slight, which really was a wonder, in view of how with mane and might he strove to grow rotunder. And, standing patiently the while, the bull displayed a quiet smile. But, ah, the frog tried once too oft, and doing so he busted, whereat the bull discreetly coughed and moved away, disgusted, as well he might, considering the wretched taste that marked the thing. The moral, everybody knows how ill a wind it is that blows. End of the Arrogant Frog and the Superior Bull This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by David Barnes, London, April 2006. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Whitmore Carroll The Domineering Eagle and the Inventive Brattling O'er a small suburban borough once an eagle used to fly, making observations thorough from his station in the sky, and presenting the appearance of an animated V, like the gulls that lead coherence unto paintings of the sea. Looking downward at a church in this attractive little shire, he beheld a smallish urchin shooting arrows at the spire. In a spirit of derision, "'Look alive!' the eagle said, and with infinite precision dropped a feather on his head. Then the boy, annoyed distinctly by the freedom of the bird, voiced his anger quite succinctly in a single scathing word, and he sat him on a barrow, and he fashioned of this same eagle's feather such an arrow as was worthy of the name. Then he tried his bow, and, stringing it with caution and with care, sent that arrow singing, winging towards the eagle in the air. Straight it went, without an error, and the target bathed in blood, lurched and lunged and fell to terra firma, landing with a thud. "'Bird of freedom,' quoth the urchin, with an unrelenting frown, "'you shall decorate a perch in the menagerie in town. "'But of feathers quite a cluster I shall first remove for Ma. "'Thanks to you she'll have a duster for her precious objet d'art. "'And the moral is that pride is the precursor of a fall. "'Those beneath you to deride is not expedient at all.' Howsoever meek and humble your inferiors may be, they perchance may make you tumble. So respect them. Q.E.D. End of The Domineering Eagle and the Inventive Brattling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, April 2006. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll. The Iconoclastic Rustic and the Apropos Acorn. Reposing neath some spreading trees, a populistic bumpkin amused himself by offering these reflections on a pumpkin. I would not, if the choice were mine, grow things like that upon a vine, for how imposing it would be if pumpkins grew upon a tree. Like other populists, you'll note, a view enthusiastic, he'd learned by heart and said by rote a creed iconoclastic. And in his dim, uncertain sight, whatever wasn't must be right, from which it follows he had strong convictions that what was, was wrong. As thus he sat beneath an oak, an acorn fell abruptly and smote his nose, whereat he spoke of acorns most corruptly. Great Scott, he cried, the Dickens, too, and other authors whom he knew, and having duly mentioned those, he expeditiously arose. Then, though with pain he nearly swooned, he bathed his organ nasal with arnica and soothed the wound with extract of witch hazel. And surely he may well excuse the victim if he changed his views. If pumpkins fell from trees like that, he murmured, where would I be at? Of course, it's wholly clear to you that when these words he uttered, he proved conclusively he knew which side his bread was buttered. And if this point you have not missed, you'll learn to love this populist, the only one of all his kind, with sense enough to change his mind. The Moral In the early spring, a pumpkin tree would be a thing, most gratifying to us all, 
But how about the early fall? End of the iconoclastic rustic and the apropos acorn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Noam Yogev, Berlin. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll. The Unusual Goose and the Imbecilic Woodcutter. A woodcutter bought him a gander. Or at least that was what he supposed. As a matter of fact, it was a slander, as a later occurrence disclosed. For they locked the bird up in a garret to fatten the while it grew old, and it laid there a twenty-two carat fine egg of the purest of gold. There was much unaffected rejoicing in the home of the woodcutter then, and his wife, her exuberance voicing, proclaimed him most lucky of men. "'Tis an omen of fortune, this gold egg," she said, and of practical use, for this foal doesn't lay any old egg, she's a highly superior goose. "'Twas this creature's habitual custom, this laying of superfine eggs, and they made it their practice to dust them, and pack them by dozens in kegs. But the woodcutter's mind, being vapid, and his foolishness more than profuse, in order to get them more rapid, he slaughtered the innocent goose. He made her a gruel of acid, which she very obligingly ate, and at once, with a touchingly placid demeanor, succumbed to her fate. With affection that passed the platonic, they buried her under the moss, and her epitaph wasn't ironic in stating, We mourn for our loss. And the moral? It isn't much use, as the woodcutter found to be true, to lay for an innocent goose just because she is laying for you. End of the Unusual Goose and the Imbecilic Woodcutter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org Fable for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll The Rude Rat and the Unostentatious Oyster Upon the shore, a mile or more from traffic and confusion, an oyster dwelt, because he felt a longing for seclusion. Said he, I love the stillness of this spot, it's like a cloister. These words I quote because, you note, they rhyme so well with oyster. A prying rat, believing that she needed change of diet, in search of such disturbed this much-to-be-desired quiet. To say the least, this tactless beast was apt to rudely royster. She tapped his shell and called him, well, a name that hurt the oyster. I see, she cried, you're open wide, and, searching for a reason, September's here, and so it's clear that oysters are in season. She smiled a smile that showed this style of badinage rejoiced her, advanced a pace with easy grace, and sniffed the silent oyster. The latter's pride was sorely tried. He thought of what he could say, reflected what the common lot of vulgar mollusks would say, then caught his breath, grew pale as death, and, as his brow turned moister, began to close and nipped her nose, superb dramatic oyster. We note with joy that oi polloi, whom maidens bite the thumb at, are apt to try some weak reply to things they should be dumb at. The moral, then, for crafty men is, when a maid has voiced her contemptuous heart, don't think you're smart, but shut up, like the oyster. End of The Rude Rat and The Unostentatious Oyster Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 24, 2006, in Oceanside, California.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Chris the Girl. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll. The Urban Rat and the Suburban Rat. A metropolitan rat invited his country cousin in town to dine. The country cousin replied, delighted, and signed himself sincerely thus. The town rat treated the country cousin to half a dozen kinds of wine. He served him terrapin, kidneys deviled, and roasted partridge, and candied fruit. In little neck clams at first they reveled, and then in pomery, sec and brute. The country cousin exclaimed, Such feeding proclaims your breeding beyond dispute. But just as, another bottle broaching, they came to chicken on casserole. A ravenous cat was heard approaching, and, passing his guest a finger bowl, the town rat murmured, The feast is ended, and then descended the nearest hole. His cousin followed him, helter-skelter, and pausing beneath the pantry floor, he glanced around at their dusty shelter and muttered, This is a beastly bore. My place as an epicure resigning, I'll try this dining in town no more. You must dine some night at my rustic cottage. I'll warn you now that it's simple fare, a radish or two a bowl of pottage, and the wine that's known as ordinaire. But for holes I haven't to make a beeline. No prowling feline molests me there. You smile at the lot of a mere commuter. You think that my life is hard, mayhap. But I'm sure than you I am far acuter. I ain't afraid of no cat nor trap. The city rat could but meekly stammer, Don't use such grammar, my worthy chap. He dined next night with his poor relation, and caught dyspepsia, and lost his train. He waited an hour in the lonely station, and said some things that were quite profane. I'll never, he cried, in tones complaining, try entertaining that rat again. It's easy to make a memorandum about the moral these verses teach. De gustibus non est disquiandum. The meaning of which Etruscan speech is wheresoever your hunger quelling, pray keep your dwelling in easy reach. End of the Urban Rat and the Suburban Rat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll The Impecunious Cricket and the Frugal Ant There was an ant, a spinster ant, whose virtues were so many that she became intolerant of those who hadn't any. She had a small and frugal mind, and lived a life ascetic. Nor was her temperament the kind that's known as sympathetic. I skip details. Suffice to say that, knocking at her wicket, there chanced to come one autumn day a common garden cricket, so ragged, poor and needy that, without elucidation, one saw the symptoms of a bat of several months' duration. He paused beside her doorstep and, with one pathetic gesture, he called attention with his hand to both his shoes and vesture. I joined, said he, an opera troupe. They suddenly disbanded and left me on the hostile stoop lugubriously stranded. I therefore lay aside my pride, and frankly ask for clothing. Be gone, the frugal aunt replied, I look on you with loathing. Your muddy shoes have spoiled the lawn, your hands have soiled the fence, too. If you need money, go and pawn your watch, if you have sense to. The moral is, albeit lots of people follow Dr. Watts. The sluggard, when his means are scant, should seek an uncle, not an aunt. End of the Impecunious Cricket and the Frugal Ant Recorded by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, Spring 2006
The Pampered Lap Dog and the Misguided Ass by Guy Whitmore Carroll A woolly little terrier pup gave vent to yelps distressing, whereat his mistress took him up and soothed him with caressing, and yet he was not in the least what one would call a handsome beast. He might have been a Javanese, he might have been a Jap dog, and also neither one of these, but just a common lap dog, the kind that people send, you know, done up in cotton to the show. At all events, whate'er his race, the pretty girl who owned him caressed his unattractive face and petted and cologned him, while watching her with mournful eye, a patient ass stood silent by. If thus, he mused, the feminine and fascinating gender is led to love, I too can win her protestations tender. And then the poor misguided chap sat down upon the lady's lap. Then, as her head with terror swam, This method seems to suit you, observed the ass, so here I am, said she. Get up, you brute you! and promptly screamed aloud for aid. No ass was ever more dismayed. They took the ass into the yard, and there, with whip and truncheon, they beat him, and they beat him hard, from breakfast time till luncheon. He only gave a tearful gulp, though almost pounded to a pulp. The moral is, or seems at least to be, in etiquette you will find that while enough's a feast, a surplus will upset you. Toujours, toujours, la politesse, if the quantity be not excessive. End of the Pampered Lap Dog and the Misguided Ass by Guy Whitmore Carroll This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This story read by the Reluctant Penguin Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Whitmore Carroll The Vainglorious Oak and the Modest Bulrush A bulrush stood on a river's rim, and an oak that grew nearby looked down with cold hauteur on him and addressed him this way, Hi! The rush was a proud patrician, and he retorted, Don't you know what the veriest boar should understand, that high is low? This cutting rebuke the oak ignored. He returned, My slender friend, I will frankly state that I am somewhat bored with the way you bow and bend. But you quite forget, the rush replied. It's an art these bows to do, an art I wouldn't attempt if I'd such bows as you. Of course, said the oak, in my sapling days my habit was to bow, but the wildest storm that the winds could raise would never disturb me now. I challenge the breeze to make me bend, and the blast to make me sway. The shrewd little bulrush answered, Friend, don't get so gay. And the words had barely left his mouth when he saw the oak turn pale. For racing along south-east by south came ripping a raging gale, and the rush bent low as the storm went past, but stiffly stood the oak, though not for long, for he found the blast no idle joke. Imagine the lightning's gleaming bars, imagine the thunder's roar, for that is exactly what eight stars are set in a row here for. The oak lay prone when the storm was done, while the rush, still quite erect, remarked aside, What under the sun could one expect? And the moral, I'd have you understand, would have made La Fontaine blush. For it's this, some storms come early, and avoid the rush. End of the Vainglorious Oak and the Modest Bulrush This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Gesine 
Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll The Inhuman Wolf and the Lamb Sandrine A gaunt and relentless wolf possessed of a quite unsatiable thirst once paused at a stream to drink and rest and found that, bound on a similar quest, a lamb had arrived there first. The lamb was a lamb of a garrulous mind, and frivolity most extreme. In the fashion common to all his kind, he cantered in front and galloped behind, and troubled the limpid stream. "'My friend,' said the wolf with a winsome air, "'your capers I can't admire.' "'Go to!' quoth the lamb, though he said not where. He showed what he meant by his brazen stare, and the way he gambled higher. "'My capers,' he cried, "'are the kind that are invariably served with lamb. "'Remember, this is a public bar, and I'll do as I please. "'If you drink I mar, I don't give a tinker's... "'He paused and glanced at the rivulet, and that pause than speech was worse.' For his roving eye a sawmill met, and near it the word which should be set at the end of the previous verse. Said the wolf, You are tough and may bring remorse, and of such is the world well rid. I've swallowed your capers, I've swallowed your sauce, and it's plain to be seen that my only course is swallowing you. He did. The moral? The wisest lambs they are, who, when they're assailed by thirst, keep well away from a public bar. For of all black sheep, or near or far, the public bar lambs worst. End of fable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by David Barnes, London, April 2006. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll The Sycophantic Fox and the Gullible Raven A raven sat upon a tree, and not a word he spoke, for his beak contained a piece of brie, or maybe it was roke for. Well, make it any kind you please, at all events it was a cheese. Beneath the tree's umbrageous limb a hungry fox sat smiling. He saw the raven watching him, and spoke in words beguiling. Jadmir, he said, tombeau plumage the which was simply persiflage. Two things there are, no doubt you know, to which a fox is used, a rooster that is bound to crow, a crow that's bound to roost, and whichsoever he espies, he tells the most unblushing lies. Sweet fowl, he said, I understand you're more than merely natty, I hear you sing to beat the band, and Adelina Patty. Pray render with your liquid tongue A bit from Gotterdammerung. This subtle speech was aimed to please the crow, And it succeeded. He thought no bird in all the trees Could sing as well as he did. In flattery completely doused, He gave the jewel song from Faust. But gravitation's law, of course, As Isaac Newton showed it, Exerted on the cheese its force, and elsewhere soon bestowed it. In fact, there is no need to tell what happened when to earth it fell. I blush to add that when the bird took in the situation, he said one brief emphatic word unfit for publication. The fox was greatly startled, but he only sighed and answered, Tut! The moral is, a fox is bound to be a shameless sinner. And also, when the cheese comes round, you know it's after dinner. But, what is only known to few, the fox is after dinner too. 
End of The Sycophantic Fox and the Gullible Raven This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll The Microscopic Trout and the Machiavellian Fisherman A fisher was casting his flies in a brook, according to laws of such sciences, with a patented reel and a patented hook, and a number of other appliances. And the thirty-fifth cast, which he vowed was the last, it was figured as close as a decimal, brought suddenly out of the water a trout of measurements infinitesimal. This fish had a way that would win him a place in the best and most polished society, and he looked at the fisherman full in the face, with a visible air of anxiety. He murmured, Alas! from his place in the grass, and then when he twisted and wriggled, he remarked in a pet that his heart was upset and digestion all higgledy-piggledy. I request, he observed, to be instantly flung once again in the pool I've been living in. The fisherman said, You will tire out your tongue. Do you see any signs of my giving in? Put you back in the pool. Why, you fatuous fool, I have eaten much smaller and thinner fish. You're not salmon or sole, but I think, on the whole, you're a fairly respectable dinner fish. The fisherman's cook tried her hand on the trout, and with various herbs she embellished him. He was lovely to see, and there isn't a doubt that the fisherman's family relished him. And to prove that they did, both his wife and his kid devoured the trout with much eagerness avowing no dish could compare with that fish, notwithstanding his singular meagerness. And the moral, you'll find, is although it is kind to grant favors that people are wishing for, still a dinner you'll lack if you chance to throw back in the pool little trout that you're fishing for. If they're pleading you spurn, you will certainly learn that herbs will deliciously vary em. It is needless to state that a trout on the plate beats several in the aquarium. End of The Microscopic Trout and the Machiavellian Fisherman Read by Denny Sayers in Modesto, California, Spring, 2006
resolve to light upon the gnat and plunge him in disaster. She saw no sense in being lenient, when stones lay round her most convenient. And so a weighty rock she aimed with much enthusiasm. Oh, law! the startled gnat exclaimed, and promptly had a spasm. A natural proceeding this was, considering how close the miss was. Now by his dumb companion's pluck, which caused the gnat to squall so, the sleeping man was greatly struck, and by the boulder also. In fact, his friends who idolized him remarked they hardly recognized him. Of course, the bear was greatly grieved, but being just a dumb thing, she only thought, I was deceived, but still I did hit something, which showed this masculine achievement had somewhat soothed her deep bereavement. The moral, if you prize your bones, beware of females throwing stones. The End of The Confiding Peasant and the Maladroit Bear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Justine Young. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Whitmore Carl. The Precipitate Cock and the Unappreciated Pearl. A rooster once pursued a worm that lingered not to brave him. To see his wretched victim squirm, a pleasant thrill it gave him. He summoned all his kith and kin, they hastened up by legions, with quaint expressive gurgles in their esophageal regions. Just then a kind of glimmering attracting his attention, the worm became too small a thing for more than passing mention. The throng of hungry hens and rude he skillfully evaded. Said he, if faith, if this be food, I saw the prize ere they did. It was a large and costly pearl belonging in a necklace, and dropped by some neglectful girl. Some people are so reckless. The cock assumed an air forlorn, and cried, It's really cruel. I thought it was a grain of corn. It's nothing but a jewel. He turned again to where his clan, in one astounding tangle, with eager haste together ran to slay the helpless angle, and sighed. He was of massive size. I should have used discretion. Too late, around the toothsome prize, a bargain sale's in session. The worm's remarks upon his plight have never been recorded, but one may know how slight diversion it afforded. For worms and human beings are unanimous that, when pecked, to be the prey of man they far prefer to being henpecked. The moral, when your dinner comes, don't leave it for your neighbors, because you hear the sound of drums and see the gleam of sabers. Or, like the cock, you'll find too late that ornaments external do not for certain indicate a bona fide kernel. End of the Precipitate Cock and the Unappreciated Pearl This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joyce Nussbaum, Highland Park, New Jersey. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Whitmore Carroll. The Abbreviated Fox and His Skeptical Comrades. A certain fox had a Grecian nose and a beautiful tail. His friends were wont to say, in a jesting way, a divinity shaped his ends. The fact is sad, but his fox ship had a fault we should all eschew. He was so deceived that he quite believed what he heard from his friends was true. One day he found in a sheltered spot a trap with stalwart springs. It was cunningly planted to supply the demand for some of those tippet things. The fox drew nigh and resolved to try the way that the trap was set. When the trap was through with this interview, there was one less tippet to get. The fox returned to his doting friends and said with an awkward smile, My tale, I know, was communal foe and served me for a while. When his comrades laughed at his shortage aft, he added with scornful bow, Pray check your mirth, for I hear from worth they're wearing them shorter now. But one of his friends, a bookish chap, replied with a thoughtful frown, You know, today the publishers say that the short tale won't go down, and upon my soul I think on the whole that the publisher's words are true. 
I should hate, good sir, to part my fur in the middle as done by you. And another added these truthful words in the midst of the eager hush, We can part our hair most anywhere as long as we keep the brush. The moral is this, it is never amiss to treasure the things you've penned. Preserve your tales, for when all else fails, they'll be useful things in the end. End of the abbreviated fox and his skeptical comrades. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll The Hospitable Caledonian and the Thankless Viper A Caledonian piper who was walking on the wold, nearly stepped upon a viper, rendered torpid by the cold. By the sight of her admonished, he forbore to plant his boot, but he showed he was astonished by the way he muttered, Hoot! Now this simple-minded piper, such a kindly nature had, that he lifted up the viper and bestowed her in his plaid. Though the Scot is stern, at least he, no unhappy creature spurns. Sleeked, carin, timorous beastie, quoth the piper, quoting Burns. This was unaffected kindness, but there was, to state the fact, just a slight soupçon of blindness in his charitable act. If you'd watched the piper shortly, you'd have seen him leap aloft, as this snake, of ways uncourtly, bit him suddenly and oft. There was really no excuse for this, the viper's cruel work, and the piper found a use for words he never learned at Kirk. But the biting was so thorough that although the doctors tried, not the best in Edinburgh could assist him, and he died. And the moral is, the piper of the matter made a botch, one can hardly blame the viper if she took a nip of scotch, for she only did what he did, and his nippy wasn't small. Otherwise, you see, he needed not have seen the snake at all. End of The Hospitable Caledonian and The Thankless Viper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll The Impetuous Breeze and the Diplomatic Sun A Boston man an Ulster had, an Ulster with a cape that fluttered, it smacked his face and made him mad, and polyglot remarks he uttered. I bought it at a bargain, said he. I'm tired of the thing already. The wind that chanced to blow that day was easterly and rather strong, too. It loved to see the galling way that clothes vex those whom they belong to. Now watch me, cried this spell of weather. I'll rid him of it all together. It whirled the man across the street. It banged him up against a railing. It twined the Ulster round his feet. And all of this was unavailing, for not without resource it found him. He drew the Ulster closer round him. My word! the man was heard to say. Although I like not such abuse, it's not strange the wind is strong today. It always is in Massachusetts. Such weather threatens much the health of inhabitants, this commonwealth of. The sun, emerging from a rift between the clouds, observed the victim 
and how the wind beset and biffed, belabored, buffeted, and kicked him. Said he, This wind is doubtless new here. Tis quite the freshest ever blew here. And then he put forth all his strength, his warmth with might and main exerted, till upward in its tube at length the mercury most nimbly spurted. Phenomenal the curious sight was, so swift the rise in Fahrenheit was. The man supposed himself at first the prey of some new mode of smelting. His pulses were about to burst, his every limb seemed slowly melting, and, as the heat began to numb him, he cast the ulster from him. Impulsive breeze, the use of force, observed the son, a foolish act is, perceiving which you see, of course, how highly efficacious cat is. The wandering wind replied, Good gracious, you're right about the efficacious. The moral deals as morals do, with tact, and all its virtues boasted. But still, I can't forget, can you, that wretched man, first chilled, then roasted. Bronchitis seized him shortly after, and that's no cause for vulgar laughter. End of The Impetuous Breeze and the Diplomatic Sun And end of Fables for the Frivolous by Guy Wetmore Carroll Recorded by Denny Sayers, Modesto, California, Spring 2006